few minutes before the session that I asked him if he would read a certain passage, Romans 16, 1 through 16, and I'm sure he thought it was just fine until he got to his room and he read that pronunciation obstacle course full of all kinds of verbal landmines. Uh, you did very well, Alan. Thank yeah. you so much for your kind graciousness to help me and assist me, and I hope you won't count it against me, <laughs> that our relationship won't be forever wounded. So, so we do. We, we come to the Word of God and this theme of encouragement. And I, I trust that, again, we understand that this is not merely... Uh, a popular <coughs> message that comes out of a coddling culture. But this is the truth from the Word of God, and it's like apples of gold and settings of silver. To us, we are, we are men. We're not given to encouraging. In fact, I find that my default setting is to be a criticizer and not an encourager. And as I alluded to last night, the Lord has taken me to the woodshed in my relationships. And over the years, there was a certain, about, about 12, 13 years ago, there was a certain crisis that came into my life familially and even ecclesiastically. And the Lord matured me. And one of the key issues was dealing with me on this theme of encouragement. So it's not just a matter of, when you're born, oh, you have a sunny personality, and so that's the way that you relate to people. No, we're to live not on the basis of what we feel and what's easy for us, but we're to seek to be men of the Word of God. And it's the Word that's a light for our feet and a lamp for our path. So we find ourselves focusing on this theme of encouragement. And what I want to do is we talked about in the first hour yesterday, the idea of the exhilaration of encouragement and how encouragement is a lot like adrenaline. And when somebody gets encouraged, it can transform them from being weakling hermit to being mighty hulk. And we talked about Jerry Kramer and the way that Vince Lombardi came to him when he was on a bench thinking about quitting football all together and Lombardi messed up his hair Lombardi who had just grabbed his face mask a half an hour earlier criticizing him but messed up his hair and encouraged him and told him he'd be one of the best offensive linemen in NFL history and the rest is history because that word of encouragement shot Kramer into NFL fame and we can have that kind of an impact, not merely imitating Lombardi, but also imitating the Apostle Paul. Now, now think with me about the Apostle Paul. He knew what it was to be dejected. Think of his own testimony. We find it in Acts chapter 9, when the Apostle Paul went to Damascus for the purpose of persecuting Christians. However, he met someone on the road who threw him down from his horse and rebuked him in his defiance. And the Apostle Paul, who thought he was going to be persecuting in Damascus, ended up evangelizing in Damascus. But Ananias had told him that he would be the vessel of the Lord. He'd be anointed by the Holy Spirit. So think of the anticipation he had for that initial ministry of preaching the word of God, the gospel of the Lord Jesus in Damascus. Certainly there would be revival and there would be many who would turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. But, you know, that's not what happened. Instead of loving him and his gospel, they hated him. There was a plot to assassinate him to the point where instead of leaving Damascus in spiritual triumph, he ended up needing to flee from Damascus. Remember they had to let him over the wall in a laundry basket? That's a very humiliating thing that the Apostle Paul went through at this time. So you think of how Paul now is heading back from Damascus. He's heading south to Jerusalem. He's kind of like a deer in the headlights. He's 
dejected, he's crestfallen. I, I was told that I was going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And this is what I get. And he comes down to Jerusalem, we're told, in, in Acts chapter 9. And when he gets to Jerusalem, certainly he's going to have all of his lacerations and his emotional wounds and his discouragements salved by the balm of the encouragement of the Jerusalem church, right? Is that what happened? No, when he cut down to Jerusalem, they were really suspicious of him. Who is this guy? He's, he's a persecutor. And now he's trying to cuddle up to us? This guy's probably some kind of a spy. He wants to undermine us. He wants to put us in prison. Maybe have our blood on his hands. So now he was rejected not only by the Jews in Damascus, but now he's being rejected by the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. I mean, this guy was down for the count, emotionally speaking, with discouragement. And who showed up then in Acts chapter 9? It was a guy named Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And Barnabas was a guy who was known for carrying around spiritual epipens. And the text tells us that the Apostle Paul had a glorious encounter with Barnabas, as it says, but Barnabas took Paul and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how Paul had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And Barnabas most likely encouraged Paul publicly by affirming his heroism in Damascus. He gave report about the Apostle Paul and what he had usually seen, the way that he stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with these Pharisees, with these people who are trying to prosecute Christians. And Paul boldly declared the gospel. And no doubt by this, Paul was personally resuscitated and he was put back uh, off the bench where he felt like he wanted to resign from the kingdom team. He became the point man then for the gospel. You know, I, I don't think Paul ever forgot that lesson and, and many more that he received from Barnabas who became his ministry companion. Barnabas was Paul's mentor Barnabas impress of encouragement, in fact, you look at the Apostle Paul's letters, Barnabas encouragement character is all over Paul's letters. And eventually, Paul himself became known as a man always carrying around EpiPens as well. And we see it uh, very clearly in the passage that Alan read to us in Acts 16. Just a little sampling of that passage that Alan read. Paul says this, listen, now think of how, how encouraging this guy is. He, he's, he's slapping on the balm of encouragement <coughs> thick. Notice how he says, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister. Now this is a letter that is read to Rome, probably carried by Phoebe. Phoebe was a newcomer at the church in Rome. Notice how Paul the Apostle gives a report about Phoebe, which opened up avenues of relationship in the Roman church for Phoebe by commending her. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church at Cancria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. But Paul's not done. He also says, Greek Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who, who risk their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. And he goes on and on, mentioning all these names. I greet Mary, who labored much for us. I greet Apellus, maybe sitting in the first row over here, approved in Christ. And look at the back row over there. Greet Triophina and Tryphosa, who have labored more. Greet Rufus, who is a choice man in the Lord, and his mother in mine. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Listen to that correspondence. It, it pulses with multiple expressions of encouragement. St. Paul wrote that passage in 1 Thessalonians 5.11 where he says, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing. It kind of reminds me of the way that I, I, I come and visit various churches because that's kind of my lot as the 
coordinated the Reformed Baptist network. I go throughout the country and I meet in churches. I just, I love to hear how pastors like Lee or pastors like Matt, in fact, I'll tell you, Matt, oh, wait, where's Matt? There you go. Uh, there have been guys who've, who've boasted and told tales about you and the way that you, in fact, it was Lee, the way that you planted the church here. No Mac, no Providence Chapel. And, and then the, you're at a church and standing at the back in the lobby, and there's a pastor talking about uh, this certain deacon and the way that five years ago he did such and such that helped the church. And there's a, maybe Secretary Yellow and the way that she is a mighty woman of God and she can be entrusted with the most difficult snowy pit challenges of being in the church and the way that uh, there's the uh, bear hug with another brother in the church who fought a valiant battle in the kingdom trenches years ago. He just, just boasts in the fellow members of the church. That's what Paul is doing here in this passage. So what I want to do here in this session together is just talk about expressions of encouragement. If encouragement is like adrenaline, well, how do I give an EpiPen? What do you mean by giving encouragement? And I've got, let's see, seven, maybe eight ways of giving encouragement. Just, just firstly, consider with me commendation. It's just commendation. That's a way to give encouragement, to commend. It's to, to heartily express approval for a job well done. And it's giving that commendation with an earshot of the one who is being praised so that this individual is esteemed in the ears of those who hear. Look what it says here in Romans 16.1. I commend, there's the word, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of Christ in Cancria. Indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Is that even being commended? It can be transformative. It's like your hair gets messed up. I, I remember uh, when I was 10 years old, I, I would always go up, I have a, when I was 10, my brother Dave was 11, my brother Greg was 12. And I always had the benefit of being in the shade of their presence. But they were off trying out for another team on a Saturday morning, and I had to go up all by myself to try out for Haviland Products Little League Majors team. And I was there uh, at the shortstop position, and I was getting all these balls hit to me. And I wasn't doing well at all because I felt really timid. I felt uh, very subconsciously uh, inferior and incompetent at this time because my brothers weren't with me and I was out by myself. I told my mom I didn't want to go. But then behind the backstop, there was my coach from my last season in the minor leagues. And the coach shouted out this. He said to the coach who was hitting the ground balls, he says, hey, I got a shortstop out there, Chansky. That's your man for shortstop. He's got a great arm. He's got a great bat. He's got a great glove. That's the guy that you ought to play and start at shortstop this year. Now, when I heard that, I, I was transformed. Because I felt so inadequate, incapable, incompetent. But when I got that encouragement and that word of commendation, I found myself just changed and transformed. And I ended up playing shortstop for Haviland's products, majors, all summer that year. And that was really a striking moment in my life. I eventually played college baseball. And it's, it's timely words that can impact lives. And we should seek to be those who are giving commendation. I told you yesterday, I listened to Al Mohler frequently. He's got this podcast, The Briefing. He's also got another podcast called Thinking in Public. And he interviews individuals. And a few years ago, he interviewed a guy named Kenneth Woodward, who was a former Newsweek religion editor. And you listen to the podcast and Woodward is kind of deadpan in the way that he's talking until about midway through Moeller pauses and he gives a commendation to Woodward. You can listen to it. It's still in the archives. Moeller says this. 
I just want to tell you, Dr. Woodward, a word of appreciation. If I ever have the opportunity to write a memoir, Moeller said, I honestly hope to do so at some point. And I've got a collection of books just to remind myself of models I'd like to incorporate in such a work. Your book, Dr. Woodward, Getting Religion, is one of those books. I think you tell the story so incredibly well, I just wanted you to know how much I appreciated that book of yours. And the impact on Woodward, you can just listen to it, it's, it's audio electric because his personality changed from being deadpan to being downright exhilarating. And just like Moeller echoes this characteristic of the Apostle Paul in commending, we ought to do the same. We ought to be commending one another within earshot of one another. This isn't rocket science, I know, but we're just considering these expressions of encouragement. One is commendation. Second one is boasting. Boasting. Now, to boast or to brag with pride about your own achievements is really unattractive. But to boast about somebody else's achievements, that's really splendid. And we ought to do it. Proverbs 27, 2 says, Let another praise you, not your own mouth. Someone else, not your own lips. And that tells us, don't brag, right? But it also tells us, do praise one another. We ought to be doing that. Now, now I understand, guys, that we wonder, am I going to puff them up if I praise somebody else? Well, the Lord brings providences to pop our pride, doesn't he? Uh, this world that we live in is filled with pride-crushing encounters. But we ought to be those who are encouraging. Paul says that we are to encourage one another and, and build one another up, just as you are doing, it says in 1 Thessalonians 5. And I got that. I got the idea that there is a, a concern about flattery. We say that if we're, if we're boasting in somebody else, then we're just, we're just flattering them, right? Okay, it's possible. The Proverbs does speak about the flatterer who lays a net for somebody else's feet. But understand, gentlemen, simply because something is abusable, like praising somebody else, doesn't mean it's disposable. I mean, think of the use of the rod. My Bible says, he who spares the rod hates his son. He who loves him is careful to discipline him. Let me ask you, can the rod be abused? Oh yeah, there's a reality of child abuse, right? But how foolish we are simply because something is abusable to make it disposable, which many have in our culture today, and throw it out. No, we should use the rod purposefully and wisely to build up our children. Likewise, we should use praise and boasting in one another wisely to build up our brothers and build up our sisters. That's what we see here in this context, even of Romans 16. Look how Paul boasts in the heroism, as Alan read, of Priscilla and Aquila. It says in 16.4, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, who, look it says there, risked their own necks for my life, he said. Now maybe it was Paul's alluding to the brave valor they displayed in shielding him from the assassination-minded Jews who dragged him before Gallio and Corinth in Acts 18. Or maybe it was Priscilla and Aquila who sheltered him from the murderous stadium mob in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. But see, Paul boasts in that. They, Priscilla and Aquila, they risked their lives for me. Even think about Paul boasted in the robust spirituality of what church? The Corinthian church. What a piece of work. What a problem child church. But the Apostle Paul was able to have an eagle eye for good thing. I don't know about you guys, but I, I find that I can have an eagle eye for bad things in people's lives. And that's my default thing. And I can criticize. But I can, I can have a bat's eye. Bats don't see very well. <laughs> a bat's eye for the good things in people's lives. 
No, we need to look for the good. And Paul did that in the lives of the Corinthians so that when he would go around to various churches, he would speak about the church in Corinth and he would what? He would boast about this problem child. 2 Corinthians 7.4, Paul says this, Great is my boldness of speech toward you. He's right in Corinth now. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I'm filled with comfort. I'm exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. Or in 7.14 of 2 Corinthians, he says this to the Corinthians. For if in anything I am boasted about you to him, I'm not ashamed, but as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our boasting to Titus about you was found to be true. Uh, or, or even think of how he addresses the Thessalonians. He boasted in them. He says, we are bound to thank God, 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. We're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. What a Barnabas personality we see in the Apostle Paul and his correspondence. And again, these words weren't intended to puff them up, but they were intended to spur them on with inspiration. Think of even the social media. It can be quite a, a toxic medium for unhealthy communication. But we can use it to be given EpiPens. How about maybe a tweet that says this? My roommate Terry is graduating summa cum laude while almost single-handedly carrying not-so-smart me through organic chemistry. <laughs> Hashtag best ever. We, let us be Barnabases in our internet communication, in our life communication, by boasting about one another. So, so what are the expressions of encouragement? Well, we said there's commendation. There's boasting. Thirdly, how about, how about approval? Approval. Alan read to us in 1610 of Romans, Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. And now to be approved is, is to receive confirmation that we're on the right track and that we're accepted by wise friends or colleagues. And that can be empowering. It can be hair messing to us. Can it? Uh, I'm from Michigan. Maybe you've heard of... Uh, Ford Motor Company. I see an F-150 out there or two. Uh, Henry Ford. Uh, Henry Ford first met the famous inventor Thomas Edison at a convention. And somebody pointed out Henry Ford to Edison and said, this is a young man. He's made a gas car. And for a while, Edison spoke with the young Ford about his automobile idea. And then Edison enthusiastically pounded the table when he looked at what he saw, and Edison basically said this, you have it, young man. Your car is self-contained. It carries its own power plant. And then later, Henry Ford reflected on this encounter and wrote this, that bang on the table, that was worth worlds to me. No man up to that time had given me any encouragement. I had hoped I was headed right. Sometimes I knew that I was. Sometimes I only wondered, but here, all at once, out of a clear sky, the greatest inventive genius in the world had given me complete approval. Mm -hmm. Man, when he, they, even, even a young man, maybe after he does a Sunday school class at Providence Chapel, for one of you guys to come up to him and say, hey, nice job. You, you really helped me to have heart dealings with the Lord. There's an account about... Uh, Walt Whitman, and he's an American poet, and for years he would write, and nobody bought his books, nobody bought his material, and to be a writer is difficult because you have depressions you go through and you get writer's block, but he got this EpiPen that was preserved even now, it's still in the Library of Congress, he, he got a letter that was written to him. 
about uh, his book called Leaves of Grass that he had written. And the letter came out of the blue and it said this, Dear Sir, I'm not blind to the worth of your wonderful book, Leaves of Grass. I find it the most extraordinary piece of wit and wisdom that America has yet contributed. I'm very happy of reading it as a great power makes us happy. I greet you at the beginning of a great career. And it was signed by Ralph Waldo Emerson. And you imagine the, the, the transformative, hair-messing, EpiPen influence on this poem. In fact, the letter written by Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson, five pages of it, is preserved in the Library of Congress because that letter launched a legend by simply giving this sense of approval. So how do we express encouragement? I'm just giving you ideas. Seen by the Apostle Paul. Accommodation, boasting, approval. How about report? Report. What is report? Well, it, it's sharing a verbal account of another person's achievements or accomplishments or heroism. <clears throat> that can be a, a shot of adrenaline that a person can be impacted by. Even think what it says there, as Alan read for us in Romans 16, 13. Listen. Greet Rufus a chosen man, a choice man in the Lord, and greet his mother and mine. There were the dynamics in the Roman church there on a Sunday morning. Everybody's gathered together, and Rufus gets called out by the correspondent from the Apostle Paul. And Rufus' mom gets called out too. Look how he, he takes the time to extend apostolic approval to this Rufus. He's a choice man. And his mother. It's interesting how he has eyes not only for the, the Rufus guy, but also for Rufus' mom. And he knows that mothers can be vulnerable to depression and discouragement. You know, Proverbs 10 1 says, A wise man brings joy to his father, but a foolish man brings what? Grief to his mother. And the apostle is sensitive to, to mothers and their emotions and their personalities and he brightens not only Rufus eyes but also Rufus mom's eyes I still remember when I was a board member of a Christian school in West Michigan and I got this letter from parent and the uh, parent said this hey Pastor Chansky just wanted you to know that uh, teacher Smith just sent me this email on her day off because she knew that I would be encouraged. It was basically a letter that said that the son had an academic difficulties and was kind of failing, but then he had written an essay that was really outstanding. And the teacher just sent an email to the mom to encourage her about how the son has turned the corner and he's on his way to academic excellence. And it just Again, change the emotional and personality climate of this woman. So then I was able to pass it on, as it were, and take that email and forward it to uh, Teacher Smith and let her know that the impact that she had made on that mother was very striking. See, reporting, reporting to one another. That's really an important thing when we think of encouraging one another and building up one another. In the book of Philippians, there's reference to, in the second chapter, a fellow named Epaphroditus. Yes. You ever read that about Epaphroditus? Why so much ink spilled for Epaphroditus? See, what, what happened there is, uh, I think of Philippians 2, Paul had been thrown into prison in Rome. That's a system that didn't provide food and, and clothing and medical care for the inmates. Like today, we treat these individuals in prison like royalty sometimes. Not, not so in the first century. So the church at Philippi took up an offering and then sent Epaphroditus with a sizable money bag and a servant's heart to make an 800-mile trip to Rome to find the apostle. And along the way, Epaphroditus was hit by some life-threatening illness that eh, threatened his life, but he eventually made it to Paul and he faithfully delivered the goods and the service but then upon returning back to Philippi, Paul made sure that he had a 
message that would be publicly read regarding the heroism of Epaphroditus to the home church in Philippi would know about the nobility of their career. Now listen to what is given there in Philippians 2, 25 and following. Let's just listen to how this is really striking report that is given. And Paul makes sure the report is written and heard. Listen to this. I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker, and my fellow servant, your messenger, and the one who ministered to my needs, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all the gladness. And, and look what he says here. Hold such men in high esteem, because for the work of the Lord, he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. We have been given reports like that regarding one another in all the different dimensions of our lives, in the marital dimension, in the parenting dimension, in the church life dimension, in the employment dimension. Kent Hughes comments on this passage, and he refers to, remember when uh, the vets came home from Afghanistan and from Iraq, and they got a hero's welcome in those airports. But what happened in those airports decades early when the guys came home from Vietnam? Crickets. In fact, even got spit on. And you wonder about the emotional scars that these guys have carried through life since then. And Kent Hughes just reflects on this. Listen to what he says this. A church, like a culture, that does not recognize the sacrifices of its own for the sake of the gospel makes a big mistake. And the wise apostle simply wouldn't let that happen. Epaphroditus had put on the mind of Christ taking on the humble life of an unsung servant, the Philippians needed to see the young man for who he was, a hero, and receive him as such. And beloved, we should lionize one another when there is noble deeds done in the kingdom. As Paul refused to let Epaphroditus' heroism go unsung. And he made a conscious effort to sing his praise by reporting his exploits. And we ought to do that. This is a simple way for us to encourage one another by commendation and boasting and approval and report. But how about another one? How about what? Name recognition. Name recognition. You know how, I don't know about you, but, but I feel more valued and respected and important when somebody remembers my name. It's a simple thing. You ever have these folks in your life who they can't, even though you've, you've known them maybe for, for months or even years, they can't seem to retrieve from their memory banks your name. And you feel it. And sometimes there can be a, a sting of it. But on the contrary, the hair messing up effect when somebody remembers your name, that can deliver eye-brightening encouragement. In fact, did you count the number of names that you had to read there, Alan? 27 names the apostle wrote in those 16 verses. What was he doing? He was messing up their hair. He was, he was brightening their eyes. I still remember when I, I'm, I'm short, but I, I'm basketball. I love, I love playing basketball when I was in high school. When I was in junior high, I was a freshman in high school, and I was a big man on campus, and everybody knew my name. But then in Grand Rapids, you feed from five different junior highs into the big high school, <coughs> Creston High School, and there I am now, trying out for basketball, and nobody knew my name. I was a no-name nothing. And I felt like I was walking around half naked in my insecurity. <laughs> but then, during a workout drill, a little scrimmage, I'd gone in, uh, in for a layup, and the head coach, Jim Haskins, you know what he said? He said, way to go, Chansky. And I thought, he knows my name. 
he, he knows my name? Now, I'm not saying I became Michael Jordan, <laughs> but it just totally transformed what I was doing. You know what I mean? When you get that kind of a hair messing up, and you get off the bench of discouragement, and you're able to perform like you just got an adrenaline shot. So Paul, Paul was a name dropper, and he used it for edification, to encourage, and to build up. Or even think about David. David had a fond attachment to his mighty men. And when you read like 2 Samuel 23, which is, a, which is the hall of fame of the mighty men of David, it's interesting how he reports all their deeds of valor. In fact, in, uh, he speaks about uh, 37 names are given, and he gives their list of accomplishments, including attacking Philistines and defending a field of lentils and breaking through the Philistine camp to get water from the Bethlehem well. And I, my favorite mighty man of all is Benaiah, who went into a pit on a snowy day to slay a lion. Well, why all these names mentioned? Why this reference to all their valor? Why this name recognition? Could it be that David's Israel had morale built up by rehearsing battlefield performance and mentioning names? It's a way David used to build up morale among his men. Or, and there were 37 names mentioned there in 2 Samuel 23. Or, or think of Nehemiah chapter 3. There they are. They're, they're building the wall at Nehemiah chapter 3. And you know how many names are in Nehemiah chapter 3 mentioned? It speaks about between the, the dung gate and the horse gate. There's a name given. And between the, the east gate and the well gate, there's another name given. All the way around Jerusalem. 80 names mentioned. Why? Because it was a way of building up and encouraging Biblical ink is never spilled without purpose. Why all these names? There's a principle that we need to learn about recognizing one another's names and using them for encouragement and upbuilding. Who, who is the best name dropper of all? I think it's the Lord Jesus. Think of that passage in Luke 19. He's going through town. There's this really small, insignificant fellow and Jesus looks up in a tree, and what does he say? What does he say? Hey, fella, come on down. I'm coming to your house today. No, is that the, what he said? What he said? Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus. come down. He, yeah. he, the master knows me. The impact. Zacchaeus, come down. Or think of in John chapter 20, there at the tomb, Mary is weeping, and Jesus says, "Woman." And she said, Lord, and not Lord, but it was the gardener. If, if you've taken the body, uh, please tell me where so I can have the body and then care for it properly. And what does Jesus say? Mary. He, he spoke her name in the one way that, that only he spoke her name. You talk about transformation from, from death to death to life to life. And even maybe my favorite is Mark 16 when you think of Oh, remember the apostles and in the upper room and one of those apostles said, you know, everybody else made the denial, you know, I never will. But then Luke 22 tells of, I don't know. I don't know him around the fire. I don't know him around the fire. And it says in Luke 22, 62, that Jesus looked at Peter at the very point when he denied the third time and the cock crowed and Peter the eyes met, and Peter wept, wept bitterly. In the hour of greatest need, I denied him. You think of the dark hours when Jesus was hanging, and Jesus was in the tomb. But then what happens in, in Mark chapter 16? The women are at the tomb, and the angel gives a message. And what, what does the message say? Interesting how John Mark is the amanuensis of Peter, isn't he? And what does it say here? It says that the angel says, go tell my disciples and Peter to meet me in Galilee. And the women go back to the upper room. And there they're cowering and they're in the shadows. And 
The women report, he's risen. And the angel said, go tell the disciples and Peter to meet me in the upper room. And they were filled with joy. But imagine Peter coming. What? What did the angel say? Go, go tell the disciples and did he really say, and Peter? Yeah, he said, and Peter. And you imagine the impact of his name being used. That's the way of the Lord Jesus. We ought to imitate the Lord Jesus Christ in giving that kind of balm and giving that kind of EpiPen shot. And how do you, how do you apply this? How do you apply this? Uh, there's a guy named John Rang, John Yeager. He wrote a book called The Positive Power of Personal Salutation. Just a name about, about using people's names. He, remember when he was a little boy, there was a teacher in his third grade class who would always say, good morning, John, how are you? In a way that was just rebooting his, his heart for a day. Because there's somebody who knows my name personally and is concerned about me so that when he became a principal, he, he made sure that he stood in the lobby of the 500 student school and he, he made sure he knew everybody's name. So that every morning he'd say, hey Joe, you, you made that penalty kick and you won the soccer game. Well done, way to go. Hey Mary, I saw that you're that your science project took a blue ribbon at the competition. Hey, Joe, I hear that you got a, a scholarship from XYZ University. Way to go. I mean, these kids would have their lives booted. Pastors ought to be like this. Uh, greeters ought to be like this. Bosses ought to be like this. Being those who give encouragement simply by way of name recognition. Tim Keller. You know Tim Keller? Tim Keller. Some of the stuff that Keller does is really good. Like his book on marriage is one of the best that I know of. But Keller writes this. He's, he was giving a chapel to the a Wheaton College student body. He says this. When I was a very unsure person, unsure of myself, thinking I wanted to go into ministry and wasn't sure if I could make it, I had a Edmund Clowney. Clowney was an alumnus of Wheaton College. He was the president of Westminster Seminary. I heard him speak at a conference, and I walked up and I met him. And then two years later, I was really down in the dumps about my prospects. I heard he was speaking nearby. I went and afterwards walked up to him and said, Hello, Dr. Clowney, I met you before, and you don't remember me, but... And Clowney said, Oh, Tim, I remember you. Let's go have a soda together. <laughs> and... Keller said, when he said that, he, he mentioned my name. He spoke my name. I was, a, I was a nobody with no prospect, but Edmund Clowney remembered my name. Keller says, it was absolutely transformative. Yeah. And so, brothers, we, we, should, we should be that kind of a Pauline personality, a Barnabas to one another. And, and for good reason, the Apostle John concluded his third letter with these words. Listen. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. And we ought to take on to that idea of encouraging by, by name recognition. Or how about, how about sixthly, how about by chewing on? This is real simple. It's not rocket science, gentlemen. But, but cheering on. Cheering on is shouting on, inspiring support to somebody whose spirits may be flagging with a sense of weakness and hopelessness. Read the book of Nehemiah. I mean, they're a cheerleader. If ever there was one, I mean, he was, a, he was not an effeminate cheerleader. <laughs> he was a very masculine cheerleader. But, he, but he, he cheered on his enemy threatened and vulnerable feeling co workers as they built the walls of Jerusalem. Remember how when he saw fear in the eyes of his team, he rose to the occasion to give them uh, real encouragement in the midst of attacks by Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem. He said this in Nehemiah 4, Don't be afraid of them! Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. We're doing a great work here! 
We cannot come down. You see, Paul cheers on his battle fatigue saints even in Galatia when he says in Galatians 6, hey, let's not grow weary in well-doing. In due season, we're going to reap. If we don't lose heart, press on, press on. Where's Darius? Where's Darius here? Darius? Oh, Darius. He's from Chicago. D.L. Moody was from Chicago. And Moody tells of there was a five-story apartment building back in the day, and it had burst into flame. You heard about Chicago fires? Yeah, there are Chicago fires. And there was a child who was up on the fourth floor, and there was a fireman who had a ladder, was trying to climb the ladder up to the fourth floor to get to the child, but then there was a burst of flame that flashed out from the window, and the fireman shrunk back and started going down the ladder, fearing for his own life, and they were whipping down on the sidewalks, and men, the, the child was going to be roasted, and they were saying, what are we going to do? And someone said, cheer him! Cheer him! So they did, from the sidewalk. Uh, sort of like, uh, uh, let's go uh, firemen, let's go firemen kind of a thing. And the guy plucked up courage by that simple cheering, went up and threatened himself and rescued. See, that kind of cheering on has an adrenaline EpiPan kind of an impact. I even, you know, practically speaking, uh, Olympics. Uh, Back in, uh, let's see, it was, uh, I think it was 2016, the Olympics were in Pyeongchang, South Korea, from the guys dressed in blue, and the South Koreans, Winter Olympics, they were total failures, until they became the hometown boys, and the Dutch, who are dressed in orange, they dominate on the skating rink, unless the South Koreans are on home ice. And the South Koreans dominated. It's impossible for the South Koreans to dominate the Dutch in skating, but they did. Why? Because the hometown fans were cheering them on. And there was maximum performance that was put out. And so I think, just think about the implications for us. Uh, think about, uh, oh, I even listening to prayer meeting. I was, I was encouraged, by the way, that as you guys pray, sometimes you, you, you're at a prayer meeting, and it's crickets when a guy's praying. It's crickets. And, Look, the guy's out on a limb. He's, he's uh, sticking his neck out to pray publicly. Why aren't you amening him? 1 Corinthians 14 speaks about giving the amen. We're just saying, it is so. Just to hear amens. And a little bit of a, mmm. A little bit of, I'm with you, brother. Or you find that to be true. Lee, you're preaching. And you hear a little rumble of a, of a mmm. Or an amen. Does that make an impact on you? When you're feeling up there insecure and wondering if anybody's resonating with you, maybe you're nodding to me right now. Even giving a nod. You realize the impact in worship? It's not just one man up there solo giving a monologue. Right. This is a corporate activity. Yes. This is isometric. You're pressing against me. And so in worship, we're doing this together as the body of Christ yes. and to cheer on one another yes. in the things that we are doing for the cause of the kingdom. Being a cheerleader is a good thing. There was a, there was a guy who became a deacon in our church just like three or four years back. And I still remember his, his mom and dad came to the church for the deacon ordination service. And they were from a, a sister of Reformed Baptist Church about 150 miles away. And they were just, they were just, just starstruck with our mediocre, our mediocre son who seemed to be so unnotable in his youth. How did he become somebody who was he's really highly esteemed at our church? And I know how it is. He's got this little 98-pound wife who is a cheerleader. And she would tell this guy, you are a capable man. You are a gifted man. You can do this. And over four years of marriage, this woman had built him up to be a gold medal team member in Holland, Michigan. And, and that's the way we ought to be in, in cheering one another on. Let me just give one last, one, one last element. How do you encourage? Commend, boast, approve, report, use names, cheer on. How about how about even physical physical contact? <clears throat> Alan, you had read in the back end in verse 16, it says there, 
and greet one another with a holy kiss, right? Yeah. In fact, in the epistles, five times, it says greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, what does that mean? Well, back then it was, a, yeah, there'd be actual, actual kissing. And uh, even, even the father, you're thinking, Luke chapter 15, it says the father, when the boy arose and came, when he was still a great way off, the father saw him and had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Right. By the way, this is the image of the, the heavenly father. Yeah. Fathers, you know, we can be these macho men who could be concerned about being effeminate. But I tell you what, in fact, who was it? Uh, when he, what, you were telling me about Vince Lombardi. You no, know, Vince Lombardi knew how to grab a face mask. One of the guys told me just this morning about how Lombardi was in the elevator with Jerry Kramer. And uh, when Kramer got off the elevator, Lombardi turned to him and said, have a good day, dear, and kissed him. <laughs> do, we, do we have that holy kiss dimension? That we have, is there a physical, physical expression that we shift? It ought to be! Yeah. We, and I'm in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You ever do any man hugging in this place? I, I even will occasionally kiss somebody on the cheek. Is that crazy? Is that weird? Well, but whatever the apostle saying is, I know there are cultural elements here, but at least he's saying there should be tangible physical expressions yes. of affection that we share with one another. Yeah, right. Studies are done. Like you, you share, like UCLA studies showed that, that say, uh, when a woman has got all the diodes on her, checking her perspiration and her temperature levels and her anxiety levels, and uh, they would say, you're going to get electric shock any moment now. And as she was anticipating, anticipating high perspiration, high temperature, high anxiety. But if they take the same woman and her husband was holding her wrist while she was anticipating the coming of that shock. All the levels were way down. There was composure. And so you just think of how maybe there are people in your church who don't have social interaction. In fact, they say that 18 touches a day is a recipe for human flourishing. There are people in your church who need to be touched. Some of you guys, your children need to be touched. Right. Some of you dads, you know, I, I got it. We live in an era of, of a Me Too era. We're so afraid about being accused of being an abuser. You know, the enemy uses that stuff to destroy right. us and our relationship. You hug your daughters. You kiss your daughters. You don't leave a vacuum of affection in their hearts. Greet them with a holy kiss. Build up one another. Yes. I... I uh, in our church, I don't know what you, your your church may be a basketball church, but you're a hunting church. I don't know what you guys do. But our church up in Holland has been a, the Riverbank Run. It's a 25 kilometer run, 15.5 miles. I've ran it five times in my life, and two times I ended up in the hospital tent. <laughs> Once with both an IV uh, and oxygen. So I'm not very good at it. But, so uh, what I did, my wife said, you know, you really ought to not run the 25K. You should run the kiddies race, the 5K. <laughs> so I've run the 5K the last few years. What I've done is I've gone out, because the 5K is first, the 25K. After I finish the 5K, I go out to John Ball Park, which is about the 13-mile mark, and people in my church are there running. And some of them look like white ghosts. <laughs> Death warmed over at the 13-mile mark. Can they go on? And I'm standing there, and I will clap. You can do this. You can, and, and you speak their name. And they, so, somebody knows my name. And I'll even go off, and I'll sometimes kiss them on the cheek. It's kind of like a, you know, Mario and Luigi and the mushroom thing. <laughs> Strengthen. <laughs> it, it's an impact that is made. But people who don't even know me see me cheering. They want to come over, and they want me to touch them by touching their hands. This is just something that is that is common, natural revelation. And we ought to use this by expressing affection to one another. Let me just give you, give you, give you this one. Back in 2001, my dad died at age 71. I'm almost 71 now, I think. That's too young, too young. And I thought that he had just uh, golfed his, had his best golf game two mm -hmm. weeks earlier. 
So we didn't expect Dad to go. He had a massive heart attack. And so Dad died, and, and uh, I remember Diane, my wife, was off in Europe, and I was all alone. And I had heard my dad died, and I was dying on the inside. And it was Wednesday night, prayer meeting night, and I, had, I hadn't eaten all day. I went and got his, his Whopper that just tasted like cardboard to me. I was just sick, sick. I didn't want to go to prayer meeting. I didn't want to face anybody, but I knew I had to go to prayer meetings. I went to prayer meeting. I, I sat in the back row. I still remember one Jacob Boat was praying. And Jacob Boat said, oh, Lord. He was harking back to uh, when the Queen of Sheba visited Solomon and how glorious it was. And the Queen of Sheba had said that uh, she had heard so much about Solomon's glory that they hadn't told him half of it. When she actually saw it, it was so much more glorious. And Jacob Boat prays, Oh, we think of our brother Dick Jansky and how he is now in glory and he's heard about the glory of Christ, but now he testifies he hadn't heard the half of it. How he's basking in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm just sitting in the back row and I'm dying and I'm, I'm just weeping. And there was a Jennifer Cushion, kind of a matronly woman in our church. I mean, there are some women who you keep your distance from. Jennifer wasn't that kind of woman. But, but she saw me crying in the back, and Jennifer came to me, and she just buried me in this sweet, motherly hug. And I just sat and cried like a baby. Mm. Wow. And that was one of the most precious expressions of, of brotherly and sisterly love I'd ever... It was so timely for my heart and for my soul. Brothers, there are so many reasons why we wouldn't fulfill this idea of encouraging one another with the holy kiss. Yeah. But we really ought to, we ought to do it. Yeah. So I've just given you expressions of encouragement. And you know, adrenaline ought to be on tap in our church. We ought to be lathering it up in our families and in our relationships. In fact, let me just give you this. This word, I get to preach tomorrow morning, Lee, on the ultimate encouragement. You want to encourage somebody? The gospel. The hell deserving sinners. The gospel. Just let me end up with this, this gospel encouragement, a little foretaste of, of Sunday morning. Uh, it says in 1 Timothy 1, this is a trustworthy statement of really great acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. And I'm looking at you. Just like me and my mere, we are filthy, <clears throat> bankrupt, wicked, wretched chiefs of sinners. That's what we are on the ground chair sitting here. That's what we are. We are, we are chiefs of sinners. <clears throat> Let me get this encouragement from a, from a father who sent his son and hangs on our stenching necks and still kisses us. First yeah. John 3.1. Think about this, dear brothers, about name recognition. I'm going to give you a new name here. What love the Father has lavished upon us. Yeah. What's our name now? Well, we're chief of sin. That's what we really are. What love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called the children of God. And that's what we are. Amen. So you see, you come, you remember what you did last month, maybe even last night, maybe even last night. You come and you realize that in Christ Jesus, you've got a new name. Yeah, you are a child of God. Right. You want to leave this place knowing that the holy, holy, holy God has run out to you in Christ. He, he hangs on your neck and kisses you with the sweetest and most lavishing affection. Hallelujah. Identify yourself for who you really are. You've got a new name. You're not old man. You're in the new man, Christ Jesus. Let's close with a word of prayer. Alan, can you close us? Yeah.